Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And this week at NCTC, we're hosting the American Conservation Film Festival, which is an opportunity for us to bring some of the best conservation films from around the world, along with their filmmakers out here to Shepherdstown. Today, we're very fortunate in that we have a wonderful film to share with you called Mapping the Blue, about the world's largest marine park currently being created in the Cook Islands of the Pacific. After the film, we're actually going to be joined by filmmaker Allison Barrett and one of the stars of the film, Sam Perkis, who's a scientist who's actually mapping this part of the Pacific. So we're going to start with the film, which is about 30 minutes, and then when we return, we'll have Allison and Sam to answer some of our questions. The Pacific Ocean covers about a third of the surface of the Earth. It is dotted with islands that are home to thousands of people. Hello. Countless ocean beauties thrive here. But many Pacific Island nations are now facing a dilemma. Should they exploit their resources or preserve them? In 2012, the Cook Islands set aside an area of the Pacific the size of France and Germany combined and created the world's largest marine park. And now the government is under pressure. Fishermen, miners, and conservationists all claim an interest in the park. If the park is to survive, there must be a balance. So the Cook Islands government must decide where these activities can take place. To solve this massive jigsaw puzzle, a team from the Marine Park will visit every island in the Cook Islands to get input from the people. And all your questions will go into a database. Team up with scientists to collect data and use sophisticated mapping software to plot management zones within the park. If they can pull it off, they will create a groundbreaking plan that will harness the wealth of the sea and safeguard the ocean like no nation has ever done before. The Cook Islands Marine Park is the brainchild of rugby league champion, Kevin Iro. He spent a lot of his childhood in the Cook Islands, where he grew to love the ocean. At a young age, seven or eight, um, I'd spend every day, you know, in the sea and uh, uh, in the oceans, fishing and uh, out on boats. It just becomes part of you. Kevin wants the Cook Islands to lead the charge for ocean conservation in the Pacific. We should be uh, protecting it and we should be leading by example. A decade ago, we were the first Pacific nation to uh, declare our waters as a, a whale sanctuary. Um, now the whole Pacific has uh, followed suit. For the last two decades, Kevin was a professional rugby league player. For most of his career, he played away from home. But Kevin returned to the Cook Islands whenever he could. Each time he came back, he noticed alarming changes in the ocean. Fishermen catching fewer fish. Some coral dying. And invasive species moving in. Eventually, he came up with the idea to create the largest marine park on the planet. Really, it drew me to really push the uh, marine park concept, really for future generations. You know, I've got uh, six kids that are, you know, I'd, I'd hope uh, that when they get older and they have uh, kids, that, you know, they'd be able to enjoy the ocean, you know, as much as I did when I was young. 
Kevin talked to everyone he could about his idea for a massive marine park, and in time, got the prime minister on his side. Within two years, they had drawn an outline of the park. So this would be our, the Cook Islands uh, actual territorial waters. It's two million square kilometers. And last year, the prime minister announced half of these waters, 1.1 million square kilometers, uh, to be a marine protected area. So this is the main island of Rarotonga. Around about there, you have Aitutaki up here and Harmison all by itself out here. The Cook Islands Marine Park spans almost half the nation's ocean territory. It covers a million square kilometers of Pacific Ocean. It contains spectacular wildlife, like sharks, manta rays, and thousands upon thousands of fish. In parts, it plunges over six kilometers down. It is a vast expanse of ocean, earmarked as a marine park. Prime Minister Henry Puna approved the park boundary. For him, the marine park is a link to the past. In many ways, we are people of the ocean. Our forefathers, you know, would travel the oceans far and wide, and that's how our islands were settled, by seafaring people. And our respect for the ocean is born out of that long history. He believes the park will be vital for Cook Islanders in the future. We need to show respect for the ocean because whether we realize it or not, it sustains life on this earth. Millions of years of evolution have shaped marine ecosystems into complicated natural systems that support thousands of creatures. But these systems are very sensitive to human impact, and across the world, many are beginning to decline. If it's looked after properly, this huge park can supply all the shelter and food predators and prey need to thrive. And in turn, these ocean creatures will provide people with income from fishing and tourism. It's a holistic view of conservation supported by Toru Ariki, the president of the Cook Islands traditional leaders. We believe that we need to take care of every species that is inside our ocean, especially for the generation to come. So far, the government has only defined the outline of the park. Now, they must decide where business can take place inside the park. And the situation is urgent because three groups want to stake their claim in the park. So there are competing interests within the Cook Islands Marine Park boundaries, and those are obviously fishing, mining. You know, then you've got um, those who, who want to conserve and uh, protect our environment. Um, not to mention, you know, tourism is a, a massive industry in the Cook Islands and um, makes up probably 70% of uh, our GDP. Plotting the areas where each of these activities can take place without harming the marine park is an enormous challenge. The traditional leaders want to create large conservation zones by closing commercial fishing for 100 miles around each island. But commercial fishermen want to fish throughout the park, except for a small 12-mile buffer zone around each island. And deep-sea miners want to exploit minerals found on the seabed. 
Right now, the minerals lie under 6,000 meters of seawater. They look like small, round potatoes scattered across the seabed. It takes specific conditions to grow these mineral blocks, called nodules. First, they need extremely deep water. Next, they require small pieces of natural material to sink down from the shallows and currents to sweep through the area. And the final ingredient is time. Lots of it. These nodules only grow at about a millimetre per million years. This nodule's about uh, 20 millimetres wide in diameter, so that's about, you know, around about 10 to 20 million years old. The nodules contain valuable minerals used to manufacture TVs, cell phones, and computers. They contain manganese and iron, and they also contain percentages of cobalt, copper, nickel, titanium, um, vanadium, and metals called rare earth elements. There's enough here in these oceans to supply the world for hundreds of years. But the mining industry might leave a legacy that could destroy the marine ecosystem. Since deep sea mining is relatively new, the government recently created a department to find out what the impact will be. My role uh, is to establish and implement the regulatory framework for seabed minerals in the Cook Islands. We have riches in fisheries and we have riches in seabed minerals. Uh, so it's just a matter for the Cook Islands of converting that uh, wealth into a bank account. But cashing in on the deep sea minerals is fraught with unknowns and environmentalists already fear the worst. And one of the concerns that I had is to consider what techniques are best to harvest this resource at the, in the deep sea. It needs to be managed and not wasted like some other countries have wasted their um, minerals wealth and they've been left in a worse state. And you could say they should have left their minerals where they were. If it's going to harm the Cook Islands, then we shouldn't do it. Maintaining the fragile ecosystem must come first. But it might be possible to have some commercial business in the park too. To see exactly where the competing interest groups overlap, Kevin enters a map of where they each want to work into software called a Geographic Information System or GIS for short. Each map makes a layer in the GIS. First, a map of fishing areas. Next, where the traditional leaders want to set up conservation zones. And at the bottom, the mining hotspots. The GIS stacks up the map layers and makes it easy to see where the interest groups may collide. The beauty of a GIS tool like SeaSketch is that you can see all these layers individually and then on top of each other on the program. You can also add in here uh, any scientific information um, as we collect it in terms of our coral research. Any geographic information Kevin gathers will go into the GIS as a new map layer. And Kevin is about to get a lot more information. He has been tasked, along with the Cook Islands Marine Park Steering Committee, with finding out what the people of the Cook Islands think about plans for using the new park. I know it's a very difficult exercise, but, you know, when you base your uh, consultations on the broad sector of the community, uh, and we have the support of our traditional leaders and, and, and the whole range of uh, our society uh, behind this project, then uh, it becomes easy uh, because, you know, it's based on what people say and what they want. So now, Kevin and the committee must travel to all the remote islands to hold public consultations. 
They have one year to collect the people's input. They are heading for Palmerston Atoll. The GIS suggests this may be a problem area. To get there, Kevin's team joins the research ship, Golden Shadow. On board a group of scientists from the Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation are also going to collect information that will go in the GIS. The researchers will dive hundreds of times, surveying Palmerston's coral reefs and gathering data about each species they see. One coral that we're looking for that we haven't seen yet. Chief scientist Dr. Andrew Bruckner hopes to create an underwater map of the island and add a new layer to Kevin's GIS of the marine park. The team journeys for nine hours at sea. Finally, Palmerston comes into view. Yeah, while well, we're getting there, it's up around the corner this way. Yeah, out here we have the beautiful island of Palmerston. And my first time here, really didn't realize how big the actual lagoon is and how far it stretches you know, to all the atolls. And it's just an awesome, awesome place. Toru Ariki head of the Cook Islands traditional leaders feels the importance of the mission. I really appreciate it. The way the, the mayor and his council members and also the elders of the island accepted us to bring this new uh, initiative, which is the Malin Path, to the island of Palmerston. The Palmerston Islanders welcome the scientific team to their island home. The research and consultation begin with a blessing ceremony. For Toru Ariki, it's confirmation that the mission is worthwhile. So we are coming here to hear your voice. We're not coming here to tell you what you're gonna do. For Dr. Bruckner, it's a chance to thank the people for allowing him to gather data that will eventually help plan the marine park. And so I would just like to really just express my gratitude again to everyone here for inviting us here and um, look forward to being able to share some of our findings with everyone here. Thank you. Kevin and the committee set out on a door-to-door -door journey around the island. We're doing a survey. We're testing a program called Sea Sketch. It allows us to show you all the maps, mm -hmm. all the information, but then it also allows you to ask questions. So every individual in the Cook Islands, we want them to have a say about how they think we should be managing uh, the Cook Islands Marine Park. And what do you think about the Azawariki plan? It's a good plan. Yeah. Uh, if you could make your own zones, yeah, where would they be? Oh, so I'll go 200 miles out. Yeah? Yeah, well, we can of do that. Of course I will do that. Each day, Kevin and the team explain where conservation or commercial business could occur. It's best to be bigger, but... And the islanders bounce back ideas about where they would like to see each activity take place. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the mining people, uh, the nodules are so deep that they're saying they can come up with um, technology that won't, is not going to disrupt anything when it comes up. But, you know. I can say the same thing to you. Yeah, yeah. I don't exactly. even know if it's true or not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Thank you, Mama. Take these, will you? 
You usually find when you do your public consultations, a lot of the elders get up and have uh, something to say. But this one's just a basic, yeah. Whereas the younger generation feel a little bit intimidated or shy. That's Palmerston, then that's the little island. Uh, so, you know, they don't really get up and have their say or ask their questions. So uh, with the Sea Sketch program, they're able to ask questions, they're able to uh, give us feedback and, and able to draw their own zones. It's certainly information I know that the Prime Minister is uh, very keen to get hold of. Too much time, if you feel differently, you want to edit your drawings or whatever, you can do that. Although there are only 63 inhabitants on Palmerston, it will take Kevin and Toru Ariki several days to collect everyone's comments. At the same time, the scientists work from the ship just offshore. They will collect all the information they need to create an accurate map of Palmerston's coral reefs. These reefs have never been charted before, and the new map will be a crucial layer in the Marine Park GIS. The researchers split into groups, each tasked with recording different information. Some swim along a line, taking note of species that live on the bottom. Others measure the size and record the health of the corals. One group makes notes about which fish live on the reef. And another collects sand and rock samples. Jeremy Kerr and Sam Perkis are the map-making team. They use a video camera and a global positioning system, or GPS. They record exactly what is on the seabed at each precise location, taking note of the depth, too. They do this hundreds of times around the island, collecting the data they need to build an accurate map. Back on board the research ship Golden Shadow, Jeremy Kerr enters the information. To make the new map, he pulls down special satellite images of Palmerston. Passing over the Cook Islands, the satellite records sunlight as it reflects off the sea floor. Sand, coral, or seagrass all reflect light differently and create a unique color signature on the satellite image. It's almost like a jigsaw of different colors and shapes that with each color representing a different habitat. Jeremy assigns each distinct color on the satellite image to a type of habitat he has seen on the sea floor. Then a computer algorithm divides the entire image into shapes based on their color and creates the complete map. Finally, Jeremy adds the new map to the Geographic Information System, or GIS, and connects the data from the other scientists. It allows us to tie all the information gathered by all the different scientists uh, together into one position on the Earth's surface. It adds up to vital information for planning the Cook Islands Marine Park. But this subject tonight is very important for us to know. On their last night on Palmerston, Kevin and his team have one final chance to tell people about the marine park and get their thoughts on how they would like to see it used. We need to start protecting what we have. Uh, industries moving in, we need to know, one, that the environment for a start that we have in our waters is not going to be ruined, but two, that, uh, you know, the resources are going to be used and, uh, you know, and they're, and they're going to be used well. I respect your recommendation. By the end of the evening, almost everyone on the island has had their say. Thank you for coming to us and uh, delivering this concept. The people living on Palmerston depend on the ocean. And the house put on the top, ready for the food to go in. The ocean is an extension of our islands. What happens to our, our oceans 
affects our island and our survivability on these islands. For the people of Palmerston, the government's conclusion on how to manage the marine park is more than just a decision. It will have a real effect on how they live their lives each day. Not only just my children, but uh, grandchildren, but my nieces, my grandnieces, my grandnephews. They will enjoy the pristine nature that we have in a place like Palmerston. The team head back to the capital, armed with the coral reef maps and the islanders' views to present to the Prime Minister. I believe, you know, it went really well. Firstly, it gave uh, the people of Palmerston an uh, overall idea of what we were trying to achieve or what the Marine Park is trying to achieve. And to be able to say, this program's here for you at any time, Kevin takes the GIS to show the Prime Minister. It was an excellent uh, way to show people, and, but then an even better way to get their views back and have that all logged into this program. So we need that sort of information. Uh, the quicker, the better. By using the GIS, the comments from the public consultation are connected to a location on the planet. The Prime Minister can see exactly where or if people want to see activities like mining and fishing. I like the idea of the marine park. I don't want a foreign boat to take our fish away. The message I would send to the prime minister is that definitely I am in support of the marine park and the no-take fish zones. I'm convinced that it is an essential step that we need to take. The geographic information system will make it easy for the government to define how to use the marine park and has already shown that people on the northern islands want to be included in the park too. If the government zones it wisely, the park could be a lasting vital asset. It could provide for all Cook Islanders for hundreds of years it's ensuring that there is a future uh, in the oceans for our people. You know, at the end of the day, we can create a completely sustainable marine park on a massive scale. You know, I'll be satisfied, very satisfied. And, you know, I hope that uh, other Pacific countries, you know, follow suit and we're actually looking at trying to protect our resources for future generations. It's the kind of lasting protection that dedicated conservationists strive for. If we don't commit ourselves to something like this, uh, what are we going to leave behind? What did we leave behind for our generation to come? Well, I hope you enjoyed Mapping the Blue. That's one of our featured selections this year at the American Conservation Film Festival. We're very excited uh, to have the second film that Allison Barrett's been nice enough to share with us here. Now that you've seen the film, uh, we have uh, something special. We have some of the on-air talent. We have Sam Perkis, uh, who appears in the film. And then we have Allison Barrett joining us, who is the producer and writer of the film. Thank you both for coming out here and agreeing to do this. And before I start asking them uh, some questions, I'd like to give you a little background on both. Uh, Sam is the uh, a professor at the National Coral Reef Institute Oceanographic Center at Nova Southeastern University. He has a very interesting background. 
He's worked all over the world in the Middle East, in the Indian, the Atlantic, and the Pacific Oceans, and he endeavors to fuse observations made from space with ecological observations made on the ground in order to unravel the secrets of the coral reef. We saw some of that in the film, uh, and presently he's working on sedimentology, petroleum, and marine ge geology. So. That's quite a resume. <laughs> you wear many hats, Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, Allison Barrett, as I mentioned, was here, I think, last year with a film. Thank you yep. for coming back. She is Director of Communications for the Khaled bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation. She heads up filmmaking, press, live events, and outreach for the foundation. She has quite a resume also. Lots of experience. 15 years as a natural history film producer, uh, working with the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, among others. So welcome back, Allison. It's Thanks a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And, and the first question I have for you, because you've been kind enough to present two films here, is what does the Living Oceans Foundation do? Well, the Living Oceans Foundation is an ocean conservation organization, and we focus on applied science. So that means we do a lot of scientific research in the field, and then we take that data, we bring it back, and we get information and tools together that we can then give to other people on the ground who can use it to make a management decision. So we try to sort of empower and inform people to make good decisions. Great. And how does filmmaking play into this mission? Well, film is actually really critical for that mission um, for a couple of different reasons. It sort of represents an easy access level into what can be quite complicated science sometimes. So the film simplifies things. It, secondly, it's a visual medium, which means that it translates into lots of different languages. Right now, the foundation is in the middle of a five-year round-the-world expedition called the Global Reef Expedition. Um, we're in the Pacific and we do coral reef studies in a variety of countries with scientists who speak a variety of languages. We also try to communicate with fishermen, local people, and film helps us do all that because we don't speak all those languages. So being a visual medium, film is crucial. Uh, the third reason that I would say film is really vital to the mission is because it helps to connect people from one side of the world to another and for people to realize that all over the world, people are tackling the same issues. And it's very, film is very transportable and you can put it online and everybody can see it. And you can feel like part of a bigger community when you can see that other people are solving the same problems you are. So we really rely on film quite heavily to talk about our work yeah. and to talk about ocean conservation. That's great. You actually have a very interesting background that I did not do justice to <laughs> <laughs> because I thought it'd be better to, to come from you. But, but what aspects of your background help prepare you for director of communications where you are now? Well, I, I mean, I am a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been for almost two decades, so I'm a natural history filmmaker. I came to that profession really through a love of animals, actually. I have a zoology degree and a filmmaking degree, and I wanted to combine them in a way to try to just share in a meaningful way what inspires me about the natural world and to help other people feel what I feel sometimes when I look at a glorious view <laughs> or walk on a wonderful beach. Just try to, you know, try to convey that to other people through film. What attracted you to this project, this, this mega marine park off the Cook Islands? Well, this, proj this, this project is, to my mind, it's really phenomenal because now we have the opportunity to make these large-scale marine parks all around the world, but that's quite a daunting challenge. Right. Um, the Cook Islands uh, really need to be applauded because they uh, have set aside right now a million square kilometers um, as a marine park, but they want to be, use it. It has to be valuable and useful for them. So planning that uh, is a challenge and at the foundation one of the things that we do is we use GIS so the Cook Islands were you know a remote place planning one of the largest marine parks in the world using a GIS tool and it was really the brainchild of uh, the rugby player that we saw in the right. in the film Kevin Eero who is um, you know a great spokesperson for the Cook Islands for GIS and for marine conservation so in some sense it was almost a story too good to sort of pass up for a film and of course the foundation was <laughs> going to be there as well which helped that we were partnering up with some of the people in the Cook Islands to do uh, reef research. The last two films you've been kind enough to bring here have been about marine ecosystems. Are there challenges in making films about marine environments? 
Yes, uh, definitely not, at least because they're underwater. <laughs> that's um, one. So that poses, that poses a challenge, but that's solvable. I mean, that just requires sort of a lot of equipment really right. to get underwater. That, and that's really the, the main one is you just have to be careful. Some of these places that the foundation goes to look at the coral reefs are very remote and there's not an awful lot of support if you were to have some kind of accident. So you've got to be very careful making sure that you plan everything properly. Um, and that's actually the, the really the main challenge in underwater filmmaking, just have you safety. <laughs> have you shown the film in the Cook Islands? We have. <laughs> and what was the reception like? Oh, it was great. Uh, we were really very happy. It was it was broadcast in the Cook Islands, and um, it, right now it plays in the Cook Islands Marine Park Information Hub. Oh, they have opened a new office there where people from the Cook Islands can come in and find out more about what is happening in the marine park, and also the system that you saw in the film where people kind of log their comments into the GIS, mm -hmm. that's still up and running. So people can come in to the information hub and keep adding their comments to the marine park planning process. Um, so it's a great little office and uh, the, the film plays in there all the time. <laughs> so I'm sure it's very popular there. I hope so. <laughs> Have there been any new developments with the park since the film completed? Yes, definitely. Um, the, the park I I shouldn't say yes, definitely. The, the park is an ongoing mm -hmm. process, so it's not fully complete yet, but we, uh, we're in the Cook Islands for the opening of their information hub, and I, I think that they're even possibly going to expand the space that they've already earmarked for protection, so which would be phenomenal. So we get a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to see what that takes you. If, if we do, we want it back here at the film festival, Agreed. if at all possible. <laughs> well, I feel like I've been ignoring Sam over here. He's been waiting patiently. And, and Sam, you have a, a very interesting background. Tell us a little about what, what you do and how you came to it. Well, I, I run a, a lab down at the National Coral Reef Institute. And what we look at is very large-scale mapping projects of uh, coral reefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason that we do that sort of work is if you're going to set about conserving anything, you need to know what you've got. And uh, we've uh, developed techniques using satellites, sometimes aircraft, but mostly satellites, to image very large areas of uh, shallow seafloor and then convert those images into maps, to, which show the quality of the seafloor, whether the coral is alive or dead, how much of it you have. And then we can start to talk about the marine spatial planning process, which is where the GIS comes in, that we can put all of that information together in a geospatial context and then use that to guide management. Is this relatively new, this type of the, uh, mapping? The, the technology mm -hmm. is not particularly new. It's been around for at least a couple of decades. But what's happened in recent years is that the, the quality of the data the, and the power of the satellites has increased tremendously. And that allows us to work over much larger areas with much higher resolution. So the technology is really moving very quickly. Before we zoom in on the, the Cook Islands Mega Marine Park, what's the, I'm sure people would like to know, what's the status of global coral reefs? Well, the status of uh, global coral reefs is worrying, <laughs> is, the, uh, is the prognosis. There's uh, uh, many factors which are contributing to their degradation. And we've seen some very, uh, very rapid uh, degradation of reefs globally. There's no doubt about it. But there is hope through appropriate conservation method methods and uh, measures such as the mega marine park that we can start to turn that decline around and and see some recovery. But there's a lot to play against. We have uh, overfishing is a big yeah. problem, uh, tourism and the use of the coastal zone, and of course the more insidious uh, uh, scepter of global climate change and changes to the chemistry of the ocean. So it's not good, but you know, there's still a chance. There's still hope. There's still hope. <laughs> How does global climate change affect coral reefs? It was addressed a little in the film, but uh, since we have your expertise here, why not take advantage of it? Well, climate change, um, <laughs> affects coral reefs in many ways. Uh, the, the curious thing about the coral organism is that, that it lives very close to the, its upper thermal tolerances. Right. And, and that's strange. And uh, why it does that is, is perhaps unclear, but it means that the organism is very susceptible to warm seas and only slightly warmer than the average. And as those seas get too warm, the coral bleaches, it uh, expels the uh, symbiotic algae which live in its tissue, and then it uh, begins to starve to death. A, a bleached coral is not dead yet, but unless that uh, warm temperature subsides and it can retake on those algae, then it's, it's going, likely going to die. And then we have uh, the trouble of uh, changing uh, chemistry of the ocean, and uh, commonly mm -hmm. referred to as acidification 
which means uh, that uh, as the pH of the ocean changes, it becomes harder and harder for the organism to secrete that calcium carbonate skeleton which the coral is built upon. It takes more energy to do that, and that also stresses uh, the reef system and can lead to its demise. Those are the two main problems with climate change. Okay. You mentioned uh, tourism, too. Right. My experience has been snorkeling or diving <laughs> in coral reefs. It doesn't seem like they're damaging them that much. What are some of the tourism effects on coral reefs? Well, it's, there's a direct <laughs> effect of too many people on the reefs and maybe standing on them and breaking right. them, but that's really not the problem. The problem is the uh, the uh, rampant development of the coastal zone and all of the uh, the uh, sewage outfall that comes with that. Uh, fertilizers put on golf courses and nice hotel lawns. This is all very unsustainable when it comes to uh, a coral reef because it changes again the makeup of the environment and nutrients uh, from fertilizers and sewage are particularly damaging uh, to the reef system. What was your role at the uh, Mega Marine Park off the Cook Islands? Well, my role is uh, I, I work uh, under the Living Oceans Foundation, and yeah. gratefully so, and we lead the, uh, the mapping and GIS components of the project. So we have a team that goes out on the uh, Living Oceans Research Vessel, we collect information on the ground, and then we calibrate uh, that information against what we see from the satellite imagery that we've shot a few months before the mission on the ship, and then we produce these vast high-resolution maps which then go into the GIS system, they go through the Living Oceans Foundation, who in then in turn pushes them out to the uh, local stakeholders. And what do they do with these maps? Well, what they uh, do with these maps is they use them as a basis for planning, marine spatial planning. They can see what they've got, where that resource is just distributed, and then start to think about ways that th that, that information could be used for conservation. And the uh, declaration of a marine park, of a, c a conservation area, is the exactly the sort of output that we're looking for. That's fabulous. Yeah, I think uh, we use it quite a bit, but I think the public might uh, not see maps naturally as a management tool. Right. Um, how would you specifically use a map as a management tool? Are there, are there different uses that are specified for various parts of the park or to set the boundaries of the park? Well, exactly. <laughs> The, the map comes into play right at the beginning of the process whereby you can you can look there's many ways you could designate the park. It, it right. could be of certain sizes and shapes sure. but you can you can place that on top of the map and see how you're going to get most bang for the buck, which critical habitats are worth protecting, and then you can use that to guide the boundaries of the, of the effort. But then, as Alison was saying, you can also now use the map to get stakeholder input from yeah. fishermen, from, uh, from local people who can go onto the GIS system online, input their comments, and those can also be used in the declaration to try to get a way that the marine park is going to function within the society that is declared. So just like Alison said, the visual medium makes it handy with yes. the stakeholders. You can actually look at a map and say, let's do this here and that there and right. put it a there. Right, picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> <laughs> How has uh, the technology changed with GIS during your career? It's changed radically. Uh, when I started working and teaching GIS, yeah. it was a sort of esoteric subject. <laughs> People hadn't really right. heard of it. Uh, now, of course, students have uh, Google Earth on their cell phone. <laughs> And um, it's uh, the, the use of maps and, uh, and GIS is, is pervaded all areas of society, even though we're maybe not conscious of it. So I think people are much more receptive to GIS as a, as a tool now. And in terms of the, uh, the, the technology that we've used to create those maps, that's just increased massively, and especially when we think about observation yeah. from orbit using satellites. And are there particular challenges doing marine mapping? <laughs> There's huge challenges m with uh, marine mapping, and that is the the thing you're trying to map. The seafloor right. is obscured from casual view. If you're going to make a map of a, a terrestrial park, right. you can see it. You can walk around on it, and uh, it's easy. But underwater, it's very difficult to even see the thing you're trying to map. So to do that, uh, we need uh, very um, advanced resources, such as that living oceans can provide. They, we can go on a research ship. We can put a large number of scientists in a very remote area. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely key. And then we have a lot of uh, mathematical processing that we conduct on the satellite imagery itself to try to remove the confounding effect of the water column and image the sea floor because that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. You talked about satellites. We use them quite a bit for our terrestrial mapping, 
But how do satellites work with ocean mapping? How can they well, see coral reefs? <laughs> not nearly as well as they <laughs> yeah. do with terrestrial mapping. Right. That's the, the, the uh, crux of the problem, in that uh, the, the water, with the intervening water between the seafloor and the satellites, uh, uh, greatly degrades the signal. The, the satellite is imaging reflected sunlight, and uh, water is a very effective attenuator uh, of, right. uh, of sunlight. So um, we have to compensate for that, and really that's just throwing mathematics at the problem, and we can process away that water column and see what lies beneath it. Sam, you're obviously very passionate about your subject, and you're a good communicator, which is, is, is wonderful in science. We, we need more of that. What, what is your passion? Uh, what drove you to this field? Well, my passion is large-scale ocean conservation and uh, trying to, um, to make ocean conservation a viable prospect. And these very large marine parks are really the way forward. There's several factors which make a marine park successful. One, it must be very large. Mm -hmm. And secondly, it must be remote. Because coral reefs around the world, they're all going to be subject to climate change. Uh, what makes these marine parks different is that while they're subjected to those pressures of the climate, they're spared the additional pressures that humanity are putting on coral reefs, the overfishing, the tourism, and so on and so forth. And that is a very interesting area to study. It's a natural laboratory because we can see how coral reefs will change in the face of changing climates without those additional pressures. And that leads us to great learnings that we can then apply perhaps to the other areas around the world which do face those additional pressures. So large-scale ocean conservation of reefs is a, is a good thing to be involved in. W to go back to the first characteristic, why do they have to be so large? Is this island biogeography applied to a coral reef or is this because of the laboratory aspect like you mentioned? They, they have to be very large. Um, because they're very diverse systems and this and coral reefs can be very large if you think about the great yeah. barrier reef in right. australia or in the cook islands and uh, they're highly interconnected ecosystems and you really have to capture large areas if you're going to build on the resilience which naturally exists in that ecosystem just protecting small areas um, it can be successful in the short term but uh, if you have very strong overfishing pressures around that small area, in the end, the degradation is going to spread. So you need, to, you need to start protecting at regional scale. And that's what the Cook Islands are doing, and it's fantastic. Okay. Let's go back to Alison for a minute. Alison, what message did you hope to communicate with this film? Obviously, every viewer takes their own message out of it. Part of the time, I was thinking how beautiful it is. I was also kind of jazzed by the technology, like... Sam was using <laughs> underwater submersibles, but but what obviously you had a plan in mind, uh, objectives that you hope to achieve. Yeah, I think we I, I had sort of two main objectives with it, and one was really to sort of showcase some of the tools that are out there to help in marine spatial planning, yeah. um, like the GIS, and just to sort of get a little bit more visibility for that kind of tool to, s to show anybody who is watching the film what a useful thing this is. Uh, so that was one objective. The second objective was sort of to show how um, that can be useful in a highly remote place. One of the islands that we visited in the film was uh, Palmerston, mm -hmm. which was just exceptionally an exceptionally remote place, very difficult to get to, no scheduled transport, and yet they are on that island that has 63 year-round inhabitants. These people had access to the internet and were able to log their comments into the GIS. They had an opinion about the the park plan, obviously, I mean, that would be really have an impact on their lives and their livelihood. So it was crucial for them to have their say. And he, it, what I liked about the story of the film was that, I, or what I should say, what I hoped you would get out of the film is that if this system works in a place as remote as yeah. that, and you can use such a modern tool in, in such a difficult to get to place that there's really should not be so many hurdles for us doing that here in the US where everybody has the internet and everybody has access to information. So that was kind of what I was hoping people would take away was to be a little bit inspired that this is not an insurmountable hurdle. People are solving these problems very far away with circumstances that are much harder. Well, and Sam addressed this too. It's, it's, we're looking at other marine parks. We hope it grows. Is there a plan um, to try to establish marine parks in, in other parts of the globe? 
Well, I mean, I might actually just bounce that question back. To <laughs> sure, I, it's, it's inside of you now. We're in the, the round table section, <laughs> literally. There, there's a, a very um, inspiring group uh, which has been uh, created called uh, Big Oceans. Mm -hmm. And Big Oceans was the five largest uh, marine parks uh, at the time of the, the foundation of that initiative, which is about three years ago, I think. And, th and they were um, used, these were five very large marine parks, all over half a million square kilometers in area, uh, which are uh, being used to provide case studies that other countries can look at. They can look at how the parks are created, how they're managed, and what benefits a gain from them, and in the hope that it's going to kickstart an initiative. And I think that's true. The uh, The Bahamas is, of course, declaring a very large yeah. marine park as well, and it does seem to be uh, gathering momentum as a movement. Great. Your passion, both for your science and for your filmmaking, have come through wonderfully. I really appreciate this. I think it adds a whole nother aspect to the film we just viewed. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, and, and because you're so passionate, and because you two are the talent, actually, uh, I'd just like to go out with, with both Sam and, and you, Allison, um, sending one last message out to the viewers. What would you like them to take home about marine parks or, or the future? Well, if I could send a message, it would be um, to watch the film, to understand uh, that, uh, that the fate that coral reefs will suffer unless we act quickly and we act together, and uh, to think about uh, everyday things that you can do to uh, promote conservation of the marine environment and support these very large initiatives and support the courage of these small nations which are also now leading the way. It's not the large nations, it's the small ones, and that's, uh, that's very encouraging, and uh, I wish them good luck and thank them very much. Very well said. Allison, last word to you. Yeah, well, I would second everything that Sam just said, but uh, I, and I would add to that that um, you know when it comes to science communication, I don't think that we can ever have too much of that. So when I would sort of encourage people to talk about science, to talk about scientific tools and technology and conservation, to talk about some of the issues that Sam has covered here for us, ocean acidification, climate change, coastal development, and talk about that to your friends or to other people, tweet about it, put it something on Facebook, just encourage the conversation, look if it's watching a film, that that's what people like, then that's good too. But I would just say that when it, when it comes to learning about what's happening out in the world, that is a really good starting point for action for anybody is just to learn a little bit more and share what you know with your friends. Great. Perfect way to end. Uh, the film is Mapping the Blue. Uh, it's funded by the Khaled bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation. And Sam and Allison, thank you so much. And thank uh, you for tuning in. And this is part of our American Conservation Film Festival. And hopefully we can get you back here someday. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.